On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Jill, and Jill was married to a patriarchal abuser. It's a story of being vouched for, addiction, protecting children, infidelity, and family systems. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Jill. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well, and if you want to be a guest like Jill is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There, please do read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out a Guest Form and press the Submit button, and please do send it in the format that we ask for. And today we are going to hear Jill's story, and there's a trigger warning for this episode. We discuss sexual coercion, extreme physical intimidation, and there's also a brief mention of animal abuse in this story, so a trigger warning for all of that. So Jill's story is one where the influence of other people becomes a big reason of why she's involved in the mixed messaging early on. And it's also an interesting story when it comes to the in-laws in the, in this story and their influence on her abusive husband and the passing down of a lot of patriarchal values as being quote unquote a normal as I guess the best way to put it. So uh, with that now all being said, I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Jill, the floor is now yours. Okay, yeah. So um, my childhood, I was born in the 70s. My parents were high school sweethearts. They graduated high school and moved in together, and they both came from, you know, 50s households with alcoholism. And so um, they did their best. Um, They were, of course, a hot mess, as 18-year-olds will be when they get married, (laughs) you know. Um, But they loved us, and they tried their best, and... um, some wacky things happened and uh, I wouldn't say it was great, but I felt like I could kind of cling to my sanity. Um, My favorite show was Sesame street. And so I remember just thinking like these grownups aren't acting the way that they are acting on Sesame street. So like, I already kind of knew it as an early child, like this isn't quite right, but you know, um, but not too bad. Um, I think things were harder on my little sister. She came along at a time when my parents were getting more combative with each other and I was older. Um, but not, not too bad. I was made to go to religious schools instead of public school, which I didn't want. That was super frustrating. All in all, I was happy. I had jobs. I liked my sports. I liked music. I was always, um, the goody two shoes kid. So um, it wasn't like super popular, but everyone trusted me. So if there was ever a problem, I was like, my mom says I was an adult by the time I was one. So I was the kid that the adults trusted and the other kids trusted. So if there were problems, everybody came to me and I was almost treated like not a peer, if that makes sense. And then my sister's almost five years younger and I like kind of helped raise her because my parents were having their, you know, battles. Um, so I was very like grown up and mature. I had, I was always babysitting in an early age. I had jobs in an early age, got straight A's, played piano. I was really just dorky. Um, so I had a few good friends that I had fun with, but I, I didn't get into any drinking or sex or drugs or parties or anything. I just was like my homework and my few good friends and I loved my jobs. Um, I had after school jobs that were with public school kids. So that was more interesting to me to just get out of the religious environment, but um, really, really had a reputation as like a goody two shoes. I didn't tattle on people, but I also wasn't going to take part in that stuff. But then when people got in trouble, they would come find me. I think for myself, I'm like super like straight arrow for the most part. But then as far as what I expect from other people, you know, more nuance and things aren't usually so simple. Um, Let's try to figure out what's fair, like, you know, just reasonable. I'm very logical. I went into the sciences. So 
Um, I just really want life to make sense. I, I would prefer people make sense or at least be honest when they're not making sense. And then I can deal with them if they're being honest. Um, I unfortunately, like, I parent everyone around me. I don't mean to, but at an early age, I was trying to help my parents be adults, kind of. And uh, so I just approach everyone that way. I'm like, no, 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 here, let me like, <laughs> let me explain to you why maybe bald face lying to my face is not okay. And I'm explaining to adults like they're three basic common decency, which now I realize that's a problem. Like they already knew that they're not stupid. Um, and so, you no, know, adults are not kids. I don't need to, you know, explain to adults that maybe if you wouldn't like it, if it happened to you, you shouldn't be doing it to me. Like that's a dumb conversation, but I've literally had thousands of these conversations with grown ass adults and I have to stop that. So. And did you have a future that you dreamed about? I did. Um, I mean, I always wanted marriage and family, but I also really I liked the idea of traveling. Um, super into wildlife. So like Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey were my heroes. Um, you know, I wanted to go save wildlife and also have some kids. And, you know, Disney, you know, made me think like in my religious upbringing, you know, there's supposed to be one guy through this and they're, you know, going to love you and not be interested in other women. And so pretty idealistic very idealistic yeah so before the relationship that this episode and your story is going to fully focus on in high school you started to date someone whom you eventually married so tell us about this relationship i ended up having a high school boyfriend and because we were in this religious environment you know it felt like you really had to marry your first boyfriend that was just what you had to do um, so we did get married as soon as we were 18, you know, coming from that religious background, um, and he was just super immature. I mean, he was a teenager still. He was spending every dime he made on literal toys, like at Toys R Us, and I had to pay the rent by myself, and he was very, very interested in other women because he was still a teenager, and it just, it was a hot mess. Um, but, you know, we ended up, um... At the end of that marriage, we went to Japan together and lived in Japan for a year. And that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It just opened my eyes. So I loved that. We came back to the U.S. We split up. Um, and our agreement was that I was going to put him through college first, and then he was going to put me through college. So at the end of all that, he informed me that he never actually planned to do that he knew he was going to leave me when I was done putting him through college. And I thought, well, that's nice. And my parents had given him a lot of money as well. Um, so then it was, okay, that sucks. But then I put myself through college and having already done international travel, I was really interested in international groups and um, started playing soccer with a bunch of international students, co-ed, super happy, loved my undergrad years. Um, I had a boyfriend during those undergrad years and he could never make up his mind if he was in or out. And that was stupid. And, uh, by the time that ended, I was not interested in spending more years with someone who couldn't make up their mind. Um, so between my undergrad and my master's, I dated a guy for a year, um, really sweet guy. He was several years younger than me, um, and I just realized, okay, it's been a year. You're a lot younger than me. You're great. Such a sweetheart. He really was so nice the whole year. So it really kind of restored my faith that men can be good people, even in relationships. But I was approaching 30 at that point since I went to college later. And I was like, eh, I, I'm really kind of interested in, you know, finding someone to get married and have kids with. My bio clock was really ticking. Yeah, within a week of breaking up, with that guy, I got an email from a coworker asking if I was single. That is who the bulk of this story is about. Um, so we have been coworkers. I put myself um, through school working and he worked at that place where I put myself through school. Uh, so he was a coworker-ish. I always thought he was cute, but I was in relationships and he, I was told he was in a long-term relationship with a living girlfriend. My other coworkers all worked with him more for various reasons, and I knew them. I had known them for 10 years at this point, 
So they all said he was the greatest guy, sweetest guy, stand-up guy, and he was with this very horrible, controlling, abusive woman. They all hated her. She was such a bitch, and, you know, she was the reason he could never go out after work, And because we all kind of hung out together quite a bit outside of work. And, you know, she was the reason he was never allowed. And he did refer to her as the warden. And I have to ask the warden. And then he'd never show up. Like, he just worked and then was gone. Um, and so there was all this kind of, I call it mythology now, but this story about, you know, this poor, poor guy. He's so wonderful. And he's with this awful woman. Um, so when I got that email, I was surprised. And I said, oh, yeah, I actually just broke up with someone, um, you know. That, that's funny you should ask because he had never he had flirted ish and done like sex sex joking that's a thing he does to flirt is you know kind of inappropriate jokes to see how people respond and thinking back um i would have been offended by that had i not already been told he was with this horrible abusive woman so i gave him a pass for that behavior so i was surprised to get this email and i was like oh are you single too and he said he was and, you know, okay, we're both single. And then he says, um, very dramatically, I am on cloud nine. Let's meet today. <laughs> you know, In hindsight, this is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> we did meet for coffee and he was like, okay, well, you know, I know I want to see you and don't see anyone else. Cancel any other dates if you have any. And he says, I've been dating a girl, but just casually, I'm going to break that off right away. And, you know, we're going to start going on dates. We're going to we're going to date each other. Nobody else. I said, that works for me. I, I never liked dating around. I prefer to focus on one person at a time. And so we made plans to go to lunch the next day. And OK, so we did go to lunch. I referred to that lunch date as the interview. Um, he actually had a paper and pen. And he asked me a gazillion questions about my childhood and about, you know, my family and about my dating history and my college life and just wanted to know everything about my history and everything about me. And then I would ask him questions back and I'm super open. I'm autistic, I've discovered. So I just tell everybody everything. Um, not much hiding here. So told him everything. But then when I was asking him questions, he, you know, oh, yeah, I was, you know, I was a military brat. We moved every two years. Didn't like that. But I've lived, you know, all over the U.S. and some in Europe growing up. And my family's great. You know, everybody's educated and all of, you know, couples have managed to stay together. And I just feel really lucky. I had this beautiful, happy childhood. And I know that a lot of people don't have that. So we try to give back. My family's just really close knit. And we try to give back because we understand other people aren't as privileged. And, you know, but it was all very like generic. There was nothing very specific there. And um, oh, and he said, oh, I've always been a serial monogamist, you know, even in college, I've just always been a serial monogamist. And, you know, I, I'm getting ready to want to get married and have kids. I'm getting to that age. And you know, I was with this, and he said, I'm very ashamed to say I was in an abusive relationship. Um, in hindsight, at the time, I thought he was saying she was abusive, but he didn't actually say that. <laughs> he said he was in an abusive relationship. But because I'd heard all these stories, I saw it that way. And he said, you know, it was really awful and really bad and, you know, kind of messed me up, but broke up with her a year ago. And I've been dating casually since, but I cut it off with this other woman that I was dating most recently, you know, after we talked yesterday. And, uh, but yeah, he, he described it as an abusive relationship. Um, and he said that she never had a job the whole time they were together, lived with him. So he had to have the full-time job plus a part-time job. Um, she, she was bipolar. She couldn't work. Um, and, and she demanded he come home for lunch every day and, you know, just really demanding that he always come straight home. And she was the reason they couldn't have a social life, um, and were homebodies and all of this and super controlling and, you know, had this whole story about that. Um, and then he wanted to go to dinner the next night. So we went to dinner the next night 
and we had dinner and he wasn't very talkative. And then when we left, was saying goodnight to me at my apartment. Um, we hadn't like kissed or had sex or anything. And he stared over my shoulder and he said, I'm going to marry you. Like in this very flat voice. And I just laughed all awkwardly because that seemed really off. And I actually felt like kind of sick to my stomach. I was like, that's super weird. And I laughed and I was like, oh, that that's, you're going to scare yourself. You're going to run off tomorrow. Like that, that's too soon. That's not normal. You know, he said, no, no, I, I am. And I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> all right, buddy. You know, and I just kind of laughed because it was so bizarre. Um, and then he said, okay, well, I'm going to pick you up for lunch tomorrow. Um, Cause it was going to be Saturday the next day. And, you know, I'm going to pick you up at noon. We'll go to lunch. And I said, sure. So uh, the next day came around and noon and one and two. And I finally called him and he just said, hey, how's it going? And I said, how's it going? What, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm just doing some laundry. And I was like, I thought we were going to go to lunch. And he was like, oh, I just got busy. And I was like, I don't like this. This doesn't work for me, you know. And so I, I told him I was, you know, not pleased with that. You don't tell someone you're coming at noon and then just not even call. So I hung up and then a little while later he called back and I, I'm really sorry. This was a mistake. Like, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. I was trying to play it cool. I felt like I, maybe I said too much last night. I got nervous and I was like, okay, whatever. So then he said, okay, well, we'll, we'll go to dinner. So we did. And then it seemed to kind of smooth out from there. And I thought, okay, he, he freaked himself out. That's normal, sort of. Um, guys do things like that. And things seemed to be going okay. We were getting along. And he dropped me off after that one, except I didn't have a car. So he dropped me off at the store I needed to go to. And as I'm getting out of the car, he says, do you need any money? I said, excuse me? Do you need any money? And he's like trying to get his wallet out. And I'm like, no. I... <laughs> It was so bizarre. I was like, what are, what are you talking about? And he said, well, my, my women don't work. And I said, okay, whatever happened in your past, that's fine. I work. I, I have an apartment. I'm in a master's degree. Like, how do you think I take care of myself? It was so bizarre. And I just left kind of shaking my head thinking that was very weird. There were a lot of odd things in hindsight. But because we were coworkers for so long, um, I really thought this is a person who can do long-term relationships. I've seen him in this three-year relationship. I know him because we're coworkers. I really liked him and I liked the idea of him because I thought I knew him from work and we had this, you know, shared office of coworkers. And by this time, everyone knew we were getting together. So it was kind of like this exciting workplace thing. And, um, those coworkers I had known for a decade, like I said, they were thrilled. They're like, he's such a great guy. You're in good hands. You're going to be safe with him. He's just really a wonderful person and sweet. And, you know, we really trust him for you. And these were all women. And they were all telling me, you know, how awful his ex was. And I thought they knew what they were talking about. But, you know, she was awful. We're so happy for you, too. This is going to be great. And um, they all talked it up. And I do think they were being honest. I think they really thought that was the case. He is quite a good actor. Women love him everywhere. Old women, young women. People just think he's so sweet, especially women. So uh, things are really moving very fast here. Uh, he's being vouched for. And that's overriding a lot of the odd things that are going on. So what is your gut telling you right here? And uh, how, how are you feeling? Oh, that's a good question. See, I'm feeling sick thinking about it. Um, I felt so shaky. I felt like I was going to puke or pass out the whole week. I was super excited because he had already basically asked me to marry him. He was like, we're getting married. We're going to have kids. I come from this stable family system. All of our coworkers were so excited for us, but I felt shaky. I couldn't eat. And I felt very sick to my stomach, like bad butterflies. I assumed it was just me being really, really attracted to him. So he was very good looking. He had a master's degree. Um, 
I thought he was this great, hardworking, stable guy. He appears to come from this really good, stable family where everyone's educated and has good jobs and they all do like community service type work. Um, and I, I just thought, oh my gosh, like after all that time with men who couldn't make up their minds, this guy knows what he wants. This guy's ready to get married and have kids. And although it's too fast, it's okay because I know him from work and even better, all these female coworkers that I really trust, they know him even better than I do. So normally this would be a bad idea, but in this case, it's safe. So very quickly, you're about to get engaged within week one. You're about to get pregnant within the month and then he's going to move in with you. So, you know, are you excited he's moving in? Are you excited to be pregnant? I, I was super excited about all of it. I thought, I thought this is this great wild love story because normally this would be crazy and it's still a little crazy. You know, it just, it felt very Disney. It felt very, and because I'm so idealistic, I really thought, well, finally, my belief in love is vindicated, right? So, like, you know, all those other men tried to make me stop believing in love, but, you know, it can happen, and it's going to be great. And I and I was very, very excited, um, and I was very, very excited to um, be pregnant. One of the guys I had been with long-term had really demanded I have an abortion at one point, and I wanted the baby, um, but I did have the abortion, and I was very sad about that still. I was really, really bio clock ticking. I had actually already looked into adoption, but didn't have enough money to do that on my own. So I really wanted those kids. Um, and, and also just to have someone to do it with and, you know, the dream, the picket fence, all the stuff that Disney. So I thought, oh, it's all happening. It's wonderful. It's great. Um, hadn't met his family yet. Hadn't even seen his apartment yet. That was interesting. Um, so he decides, you know, I'm moving in with you. And he sort of informed me, but I ended up as I'm, so now we're maybe two weeks into our relationship and he's, I'm helping him move into my home um, that I share with my sister and I'm packing for him. I end up finding notes, pages and pages of notes he has written to himself. So I'm finding all of these notes he's written to himself after our dates um, where he's like writing down all these little details and then asking himself questions and then answering them. It's very weird. Um, the things that he was writing about you, what were the things like attached to it in the sense of like, he would write something about you and then would he like write down something that was like something he could use against you and how to like battle that? Um, basically, yes. So, you know, like for the knives part, he wrote that I was afraid of knives and he wrote um, the incident, you know, I don't want to say who in my family, but someone in my family threatened someone else with knives at one point. So I, at that point onwards, from when I was about eight, I was always just really creeped out by knives. Like if I have a big knife in my house, I like put it in the sink under the dishes. Like, I don't want to see it. I just don't like the visual. Um, and I'm not someone who would like those magnet boards. I wouldn't like have them out. Like I just don't, it creeps me out. I've gotten over that more recently, but, um, and then things like, you know, he wrote down that there were times when like my uncles made inappropriate comments about my body when I was hitting puberty that made me feel creeped out. Right. So then when he's making inappropriate comments about girls or his daughter, then he can say, this is not about me. This is about your childhood and you're making your childhood about me. And I've watched his brother and his dad use that exact same tactic on their wives. No, no, I'm not cheating on you. You're overly suspicious because you're still having issues from when your dad cheated on your mom. Stop making it about me, right? So it's that kind of um, get out of jail free card um, to, to control people, to make people look crazy, um, and to get away with the shit they want to do. Because they're going to do what they want to do, and they're already pre-plotting how to get away with that and how to make you feel bad about even asking. Uh, so after those three dates, there were no more dates. Uh, we were just into moving him into my house and planning the wedding. 
I ended up planning the entire wedding myself on a pretty low budget. It was just a backyard wedding. I didn't want anything crazy financially or otherwise. But during the time we were engaged from April to August, um, really didn't see much of him. He was gone all the time for work and he would come home late at night and we would kind of have a glass of wine and talk a bit and, you know, sleep together. And then he was off to work the next day. And that was kind of the routine. And it all seemed pretty normal until um, um, a week before the wedding, we were driving in his car and um, he said something about, oh, when you change your name and we had not talked about that. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm keeping my last name. I've already been married before. I, you know, I don't want to lose my name again. I'm still me. You know, I have my degrees in my name. I'm keeping my name. And he started yelling and like slamming his fist on the dashboard as he was driving. And he was like, no, my family does it this way. We do it this way. And, you know, and I was like, well, this will be a new we. And um, I'm not going to give up my name, um, you know. And then he said, well, well, okay, I guess you could hyphenate. And I said, well, I will if you will. And he said, what? No, I'm not doing that. And I said, well, why should I? And uh, he slowly, slowly came around, you know, and he's like, my name is my name. It's who I am. And I was like, exactly. And so then, okay, I guess I can see your point of view. So it seemed like he calmed down a little bit about that. Um, during that conversation, I had already my uh, a trip overseas planned for my master's degree that I needed to do research for six weeks. And it was already planned before I got together with him. And it was going to happen after we were married. Um, so at one point in that conversation, he was yelling, I'm letting you go on your trip. And I said, excuse me, you don't let me do anything. I am going. This is my degree. This was already planned. You knew about this. You, you don't let me do or not do anything. And he, you know, grumbled and got kind of mad and then informed me, well, I probably do have some sexism. I'm less sexist than my dad and he's less sexist than my grandfather, but I probably do have some sexism still to let go of, you know, okay, I need to work on that. Seemed reasonable um, until later that night, he, um, started talking politics his family talks politics all the time that's the fun thing to do is argue politics and um he made a comment and i said oh no I, I think this other thing and i had a difference of opinion and suddenly he was screaming fuck you fuck your bullshit and he was in my face and all popped up and fist clenched and i said wow okay i don't know what you're used to but i don't swear at people and i'm not going to be with someone who swears at me that's not okay for me because i still thought okay maybe some people do this when they're riled up but i don't do this this is and i still thought if i tell him i'm not okay with being sworn at he'll stop right because he loves me so telling him he couldn't swear at me resulted in him getting further into my face towering over me veins bulging he had his fists just clenched and he was just screaming like I've never heard a human being scream before like fuck you you're nothing you give me nothing you give me nothing and um just kind of screaming over and over again how I'm nothing and I gave him nothing um so I started shaking really bad um really kind of instant PTSD response um shaking crying I was very physically intimidated and you know like what are you talking about i'm i'm pregnant you're in my home we're getting married what more could i give you and he screamed that's nothing that's all nothing and just kept screaming the word nothing so we were on my porch i ran inside he followed me in and proceeded to follow me around the house for about two hours screaming and ranting and raving and he wouldn't let me escape him at this point it's after dark um by the end of it i was just exhausted so i sat on my couch and i picked up my pet rabbit and i was just like kind of crumpled up and shaking and just silently crying and he was still pacing and yelling and i was petting my rabbit um just trying to calm down so I, uh, from the first moment he started screaming about the nothing part, 
Um, th at that point, I was afraid for my life. So I now spent two hours afraid for my life. So I was quite exhausted. Um, and just, I knew in my head, like, hmm, okay, no one at work knows this person. This is some kind of fake person. And so I was sitting on my couch petting the rabbit and he was pacing. And then finally he walked halfway across the room and stood in the doorway. And then he just started staring at me with this really creepy smile. Sorry. <laughs> it's stressful. It's so many years ago, 17 years ago. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so he had this really horrible, creepy smile and he got really quiet and I'm just still sitting there kind of very primed to move. Like I'm, I'm, I may have to move at any second and you know, is there anything I can use as a weapon? How am I going to protect myself? And then he started staring at my rabbit and saying things like, boy, you sure do like that rabbit a lot. Don't you boy? I just think it's really weird how much you would like a rabbit. You know, and just like this, and then he would smile this really creepy, terrible smile at me and like staring hard at my eyes. And I thought, oh, okay, he's going to rush across this room at any moment and like attack me. And for some reason, my poor rabbit. And I was just very scared and very frozen. Luckily, um, all of a sudden I heard keys in the door. My sister and I owned this house together. Um, she came in the door and he just looked like really terrified and he physically ran out the back door and my sister turned and looked at me and she saw i'm just i have been crying for hours now she said what the what the hell what's going on what happened because all she could think is something terrible has happened like someone has died or something right um i said we have to lock him out he apparently ran off to a mini mart nearby and he bought bottles and cans and cans i should say the tall cans cans and cans of some kind of alcohol called evil eye specifically <laughs> and he drank them all and ran around the backyard yelling and screaming for several hours late into the night um and throwing cans around and stuff and we were thinking to call the police but he wasn't like approaching the house so at some point we saw him lay down in the hammock and we just were like i guess he's going to sleep now so you wrote me that you were able to explain away the situation to your sister on him drinking, even though before the whole running around in the backyard, he actually had only had half a beer to drink. And like the rest of your family, uh, your sister was a big fan of his. So this was easily brushed aside by her. And when it came to your relationship with your husband, uh, he was able to smooth things over. He was blaming things on his past traumas. And then he also did some poetic love bombing and about how madly in love he was uh, with you. So you're still on the road to getting married here with these love bombs after this incident incident, but you ended up having a miscarriage along the way. So tell us what happened from here. Um, I did miscarry at 13 weeks before the wedding um, and met his parents for the first time right before the wedding. I was miscarrying when I met them. Um, his mother insisted on talking to me about it. And I said, I really don't want to talk about it. It's too fresh. It's happening right now. And she said, oh, no, don't worry. Now you get the fun of trying again, you know, just see the positive. And then she starts telling me um, about sex positions that she thinks will help. And then that was the first time I met his parents. Um, they decided they wanted porta potties at my wedding and I was paying for the wedding. It was in my home. I said, no, two bathrooms is enough. We've only invited 50 people. I'm not doing porta potties in my backyard for a small backyard wedding. That's really gross. Um, they ended up yelling at me for over an hour, both of them, in front of my, at that time, fiance. I ended up sitting on the couch, uh, putting my head between my knees, trying to breathe. And he, of course, won't say a word. Um, the only thing he ever did say was, maybe they're right. Maybe we should get a porta potty, you know. So um, that was my introduction to the in-laws. So your wedding ended up being okay, but something big actually happened on your wedding night. So walk us through this. We had a ceremony and he was kind of MIA the whole rest of the wedding. Um, I assumed he was drinking. I didn't think much of it. Uh, and then we went to a hotel after everyone was gone and we got in the hotel room and we were taking pictures in our wedding outfits still. And it was a really pretty hotel room. 
And then um, he, I was putting some stuff away and he sits on the bed and he starts staring at me with that like predatory aggressive stare again. And he says, we don't have to have sex. I said, of course we don't. No one ever has to have sex. And then he started yelling and ranting and fuck you and, you know, fuck your bullshit and all this kind of stuff again. And, but he couldn't really get up off the bed that time because he really had been drinking a lot more. And so he was just drunkenly swearing at me. And I said, I'm still having a miscarriage. I'm going to go take a bath. And I did. And I was just like, oh my God, what a jerk. Um, and so that sort of set up this whole process where for the first seven years, I thought alcohol was the problem. I thought he was an alcoholic and I thought this is all and pot. I thought this is alcohol and pot. He's an addict. He needs to get rid of the addiction or at least not drink or smoke as much because that's when these things are happening. And I really thought that's what it was about. Um, and he also first year he blamed it on his ex and so did his family. So at the wedding, they told me, if you ever have any problems with him, you come to us, we'll help you. We believe in marriage, your family now, you're a part of the family just as much as he is, we'll protect you. If you have any problems, come to us. So within the first few months of marriage, I did try to talk to them about it. They came to visit us and something, somehow it came up and I said, well, he, he is getting really drunk and stoned every night and starting arguments and screaming at me and swearing at me and, you know, physically intimidating. It's happening every single night. And then in the morning, he swears he has no memory of it. And he also doesn't believe me. He doesn't think he's doing it. And his mom immediately said, well, what are you doing to make him do that? I said, excuse me, I'm not doing anything to make him do that, he's getting drunk, he's getting stoned. And she said, well, he never did that before. You must have introduced him to those things. I said, no, he definitely did this before me. And she said, well, it must have been his horrible ex. She got him into all this. And I said, no, he told me he started drinking every day when he was 12. <laughs> and she got really mad and she stormed off. So that was kind of the end of us getting along. Um, and that was maybe three months into the marriage. So in the first seven years, you do end up having two children with him. And as you stated earlier, you thought he had this drug and alcohol problem that was causing everything. But eventually you find some of his notebooks that change your mind a little about everything that's going on. And you are also just trying to keep two kids alive and protected from him. So uh, walk us through uh, this part of your story. So I felt like I was just constantly trying to physically keep two kids alive that were very young around someone who was drunk, stoned, all kinds of inappropriate. Um, he liked to make himself drinks late at night, like two in the morning, except he kept using a cutting board to cut limes on the floor with these huge butcher knives and he would leave them all over various places of our apartment on the floor. And when you're finding toddlers with knives in the morning, it's not cool. So I ended up throwing out two whole sets of knives. The first set got thrown out. Um, his parents got mad at me and bought him a second set. He did it again, repeatedly. I'm talking like over and over and over again. Um, promising not to do it again, doing it again. I have to make myself a drink. What don't you understand? I work so hard, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, why can't you put it in the sink? Um, you know, and then um, throughout the second set. And after that, I started finding um, his notebooks. And one of them had a list of all of my fears and what they are related to. And I was very scared of knives as a kid um, because of some weird stuff that happened with my family where someone threatened someone else. And he had written that down. Um and there were all these other specific fears of mine. And he did quite a lot of things accidentally related to all those fears. And he would write them down. He, he wrote all this down. It's really crazy. <laughs> um, but uh, so, yeah, seven years. And I would find um, 
a lot of unsafe things kind of always in our house that he would set a tool on the very edge of a counter, you know, so a kid could pull the cord and just all this stuff that I would keep asking him. I don't understand why you can be competent at your work, but you can't keep track of basic safety items like how to buckle a seatbelt properly. Some of the events that happened, um, so multiple times in that seven years, I would go to him and say like, look, this can't happen anymore. Um, you know, you're abusing me. You're almost killing the kids left and right. You know, this, this can't happen. I'm not gonna do this anymore. Um, and then he would threaten divorce. And when that didn't scare me enough, he would say, well, I'm going to take the kids. And I would say, well, you know, where we live is very much a 50-50 state. Um, and he said, well, I'm going to be getting as drunk and stoned as I want to with the kids. And they were at this point still infants. So those became threats. Um, and that threat actually did start to scare me. And he started to strongly insinuate that more of these terrible accidents that kept occurring with me there would be happening with me not there. So he very much knew that he was threatening their lives and I knew it. And because he was actually doing it regularly, I knew it was a valid threat and actually probably they wouldn't have survived. So I started thinking to myself, okay, I, I really can't have any freedom from this until they're 18. Um, and the very last time after that seven years, um, the kids were three and five and I said, you know, I will tell a judge that you have a serious alcohol and drug problem and how many times you've had these negligent incidents with kids and, you know, they're going to put you on some kind of drug and alcohol program. And then he, he said, I will choose you. I will stop drinking and smoking pot. You know, I, I will be done with this stuff um, and I can just be sober. And it seemed for a few years like he did he still wasn't around. He still wasn't interested in the kids unless there was like an audience to show off for. Um, still more interested in calling his mom or other family members or talking to neighbors, just anything other than being with me or the kids. Um, but that was still better than what had been happening before. So I sort of accepted it. Um, so you, you're using the word accepting it or the, the term accepting yeah. it. You've gone through this first seven years and now you're, you know, your eyes are more open. You've first listened to these people who were vouching for him and you know that none of this is the truth about him. You're in a hole here. Threats are coming at you, your children, everything that you've ever wanted or you dreamed of, you know, is this family is, you know, this future might be taken away and you're stuck in this spot of now really having nowhere to really maneuver. So are you talking to people about what's going on? Are you scared? Are you just, or are you just survive? Are you just surviving and trying to logically think your way out of this issue? Or- I was. I was trying to logically think my way out and just kind of plan. Just how do I keep the kids safe? At that point, I just I didn't care about myself anymore. Whatever. Um, my health was really starting to fail, and um, so I just thought, you know, I have to get these kids to eighteen alive. And furthermore, I would like, if possible, for them to not know any of this they're just little kids i would like them to think that their childhood is disney regardless of him and whatever is going on with his family um but also at that point i was quite isolated he was still working at multiple jobs i was home with the kids i was not able to get back into my career field and the only people really coming around at that point was you know my family and his family my family loved him I didn't want to try to get into some kind of thing where I'm trying to explain why I don't feel safe to leave him because of child safety. Um, His family has now bullied me this whole time. They said the weirdest things. They they would say, well, some kids die, you know, you can't worry about that. Um, And so their attitude was that adult ego and pride is always more important than a child's life. And why didn't I understand this kind of hierarchy and, you know, respecting adults and respecting my elders and respecting men and, 
you know, this is what love is. You've got to forgive people. And forgiveness means you just don't speak about it. Oh, did he almost kill the baby again? My mother-in-law told me that her husband did that sort of thing too, babies. And she forgave him because she loved him. And she never spoke of it. Because everything's better if we just don't speak about anything like that. Um, in their family, men are free to say whatever, including making really graphic sexual comments about their own children. But women don't say anything. For women to say anything would be anti-family. That would be a problem. Um, so the whole concept of family in their mind is very patriarchy-based. Um, the mother-in-law always wanted to talk to me about sex. She wanted to talk to me about cheating a lot and how cheating could make you a better spouse because your guilt would actually make you be nicer to them and that you should just never tell. You should just never tell if you cheat. And during this time, he did give me two different STDs. Um, and one of the conversations with my husband early on, um, by the time we had two children, we were not having sex very often. And he mentioned it. And I said, well, I don't like the way you're treating me. It's not sexy. Nobody would find this sexy. And he told me, no, sex is your job. It is your job. And I said, no. But after that, he started threatening again that if I didn't have sex with him, then he would divorce me and take the kids and, oh, the kids, the kids would die, you know, all this kind of. So at this point, I'm thinking, OK, I don't want to have sex with this man anymore. So that was many years ago. Um, but if I don't at least occasionally have sex with him, even though he's clearly cheating and he's giving me STDs, then my kids' lives are on the line. So I'm sitting there thinking this is you know, horrible, but do I have to have sex with this man to save my kids' lives? I mean, what a gross. And, and I tried to talk to him about that. And he still can't see a problem with it. Um, to this day, he can't really see a problem with it. So that's just the way his family is. So how are your kids feeling about him? They actually started realizing that daddy sure likes to show off, you know, when, when company's over and they realized he never paid attention to them unless there was an audience. And so they were already starting to feel kind of frustrated. Um, and when other people weren't around, if he did interact with them, it was playing mean jokes on them, making them cry. Um, so they already kind of weren't so into him, but I was still trying to encourage, you know, he works really hard and I was just trying to encourage them to be sweet to him just for, I guess, safety reasons, really. Um, and I still kind of just hoped that maybe things would somehow turn out okay. Um, in 2017, he quit the full-time job and started a business. So then we bought a property with acreage and he was working from home. Um, the shop is on the same property as the house. So he could have the shop to work in and he could work from home. And as soon as we got out there and we're kind of unpacking and settling, I discovered him smoking pot at nine o'clock in the morning out by the shop. And at that point I had thought he had quit three years earlier and he ended up getting mad at me as he always does when I catch him. And, um, and then finally saying, okay, well, yeah, I, I sort of quit the alcohol, but I still drink when I'm out of town or when I'm away from you on my, you know, work trips, but I never quit the pot and I never will. And I was like, oh my gosh. So at this point we're in a state where pot is very illegal. He made some little comment about, oh, we've got this five acres. You know, I may throw a plant or two out in the backwoods. And I happen to know from neighbors who worked for the sheriff's office, no, 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 this is a felony. In that state, you're not allowed to grow any pot whatsoever. Um, if you grow pot on a property with children, it's considered a class one felony which carries like a minimum of 15 years. Um, and I was like, you know, we could get the kids taken away. I, the website says, you know, they'll take your kids. This is considered child abuse. Um, and so he promised he wouldn't do it. And I said, well, you've broken every other promise you've ever made, but you need to understand this is my last line. This is my last line in the sand. If you get these kids taken from us, if you or I get thrown in prison for this stupid thing you're doing, that will be unforgivable. It will never, ever forgive you. Do you understand? He said, yes, I understand. Um, but he did indeed 
grow a ton of pot on the property with grow lights and um, turn it into um, something stronger. Uh, so he was ordering these very high THC strains, much higher than old school stuff. And then he was condensing it into um, like a wax or a, but it's condensed into something stronger. So um, as he was escalating that, he started to escalate against the kids as they started to get bigger. Um, you know, they're now hitting puberty. They're starting to think for themselves. They're starting to read books and just kind of really expand their universe and their personhood and um, being more opinionated as they should. Um, and that started to really deeply enrage him. Um, he still in his mid forties is not allowed to think for himself. He says we, and he means all of us from like his dad down to our kids were a we, and we're all supposed to think like his dad does. Um, so he assumed that that would continue. And as he started actually trying to talk to them now that they were looking like bigger people, um, that they had their own minds and they weren't just going to agree with him. And then he started to get really mad at me. In his mind, this was me undermining him. He was supposed to give them guidance, authority, um, tell them what to think and how to feel for the rest of their lives. Um, he calls his parents every week and he asks them every little thing he should do. And he just follows their orders about how he should live his life. And that was his expectation for them. And in his mind, I have now like robbed him of that. So he became more and more angry um, with me, but also directly at the kids. I know that his dad scared him and his brother by using physical violence. And so he thought, oh, I know. I'll scare the kids with physical violence and then, you know, they'll comply. So um, lots of emotional abuse. So straight up lying, um, lots of denial, lots of um, gaslighting, like literally will say or do something and then claim to have not done it seconds later. Um, sometimes he will claim that you did or said the thing that he just did. Uh, then when you point that out, he becomes very paranoid that he's being recorded um, he will then turn to physical aggression, try to scare you into silence. He will guilt trip you. I just work all the time. He really likes to yell out that he's being crucified. Like he thinks he's Jesus. Um, I'm just being crucified and he'll, you know, get very dramatic. Um, and if that doesn't work, he'll go back to rage and he just kind of quickly cycles through all these tactics. Um, if none of them work, between the guilt tripping and the, he does some threatening of the kids' pets now, um, things like that that are important to them. Um, he actually tried to blame his pot use on my younger child who was 11 at the time. It was because she had pets and they were so expensive and it stressed him out so much he needed the pot. But lots and lots of this kind of, um, but lots of gaslighting with the kids. So he would, take them aside one by one and start telling them really wacky things. Um, things like what makes something real and true is if enough people say it. And he would tell the younger daughter things like, you know, staring at the fire and saying, see, men are fire and women are wood and men consume and destroy women, but that's what creates new life in forests. Um, he told her, the reason for our species success in this world is male violence. So women need to be grateful to men for violence because um, that's how society was created. That's how civilization was created. Um, you should be happy that I scare you sometimes because then you'll know that if a bad guy came to our house, then I could protect you with that same violence. So it should actually be reassuring, you know, and just all this kind of, really crazy stuff, you know? So it just a lot of inappropriateness and volatility and then the guilt tripping and then the drama. Um, and then usually it goes some kind of physical, he doesn't technically hit, but um, things may accidentally happen when he's just, you know, he calls it being passionate, he's enraged. Usually at the end of all of that, if he can't like win, uh, he will physically run away just run and come back an hour or two later and expect everyone to pretend it didn't happen. 
So these abuses are going on. You've dealt with his family already. We know that they are not the best people in the world. And as these things go on, you know, sitting here and listening to your story, it's it's not just him. Uh, he is this program or thing created by his parents who were created by their parents and this this culture of this family, this very patriar- patriarchal culture that is going on, that's getting passed from, from generation to generation is really uh, going on and, and they're going to start getting uh, more involved. So eventually they start attacking you. So uh, what is going on here? Uh, walk us through this been a common theme with his family no no we're we're great we're perfect you're just bringing your childhood baggage into our family you need help you need therapy um i got to the point where i actually asked them you know so what do you want me to tell a therapist you want me to tell a therapist that i need help so that i can be in a place where you know my brother-in-law, who's six foot three, can be standing and screaming in my face that I'm a fucking bitch and I won't be upset. I won't be scared. Um, I, they should make me think that's normal. Um, and they actually have this belief that um, it's perfectly OK for men in the family to yell and be physically aggressive with females in the family. And we are not allowed to be afraid of them or use the fear card and, you know, kind of gender stereotype them. We're not allowed to do that because they haven't actually hit us yet. So unless a man has already hit you, you are not allowed to be afraid or say they're staring you. Um, That's not fair. Um, You're not allowed to complain at all about male abuse because they have jobs. So you apparently can't be an abuser if you have a job, you know, just all sorts of ways that they justify this and they justify it to the kids too. So um, during the pandemic, we decided that the state we lived in was not um, a great state to have older kids in. We were in a very rural area. You know, we wanted to be in a more balanced place in a place that had a little more um, higher educational goals, I guess. Uh, so we decided to look for a second home and we were going to kind of go between properties, um, and hopefully be a type of winter bird because we own a business. We thought we could probably move the business twice a year. So we did buy a house, uh, multiple States away. My husband moved the kids and I up here. Then he went back to the other property. He was going to finish working out that one year. And the plan was, he would work there for a year and then he would transfer his business permanently to the place where we intended to spend more of our time, the bulk of it. And then the original property would have been more like um, to get away from the cold and stuff. So he had been saying, Oh, I, I think I can come up about once a month. I think I can, you know, get enough work done ahead and take a weekend off and fly up and see you guys about once a month. And we said, okay, that sounds great. I know from the notebooks that I found that what he did instead was as soon as he got us up here, he went back down. He brought the entire pot operation into our home and he set up grow lights in all the rooms, including our children's bedrooms. And he grew a lot of pot plants in the house. So during this time, you know, the first couple of months go by and I'm going, well, you're not calling very often, Um, you know. And he was saying, oh, I'm just really busy. I'm more swamped than I thought I would be. And, okay, well, when are you coming to visit? And, uh, well, I've just got a lot more work than I thought I was going to get. And I said, okay, no problem. We'll come and see you. And, no, no, I I don't really feel like we can afford that right now. Let's just not do it. We're okay. Okay, we're okay. You know, you must miss the kids, but we're okay. Um, And uh, the kids did, you know, miss him in their own way. Um, And so this went on the whole year and uh, we didn't see him. And at some point during the year, he started saying, no, I I don't think I'm going to move my business up there. I think my business is going to stay here. And, you know, you'll just have to visit me down here a few times a year. And I said, oh, okay. So you intend for us to really be raising the kids apart for until they're graduated. And he was like, yeah, yeah. I don't see any other way. I'm not going to move the business. And I was like, okay, this is very confusing to me. I thought, you know, we were doing this together. Uh, He made some comments to our younger child about a woman, lots and lots of talking about a specific woman. And so she told me that she thinks he had a girlfriend. Um, 
So you did end up living apart for a whole entire year, and you wrote me that it was pretty peaceful during that time, but the kids did miss him in their way. And he eventually does come visit you for six weeks after that year apart, and then it didn't take long before it was more of the same type of abuses that were going on. However, you also wrote me that you did end up going back with him to the Southern home. So walk us through this. Um, and so we did end up going back with him after about six weeks to his, to our other property. And that's when I discovered that he had been committing a class one felony with all this pot growing, especially in the home, in children's bedrooms. And he has completely taken all of our stuff out of the house. He has like redecorated it and none of our stuff is there anymore. And he has somehow brought out all this stuff of his that he saved since college. I don't even know where he hid all this stuff for 17 years, but he saved all this stuff from when he was single. And he redecorated our house as his college apartment. It was bizarre. And yeah, there was condoms in different areas of the house that weren't mine. Um, He actually had to leave for about a week. And my daughter started finding this weird substance, this sticky, dark, gooey stuff. It was, she likes to bake. So it was in all of her bakeware and she was having to wash it out of things. And then she, she found it on all of her sewing scissors and like they have her name on them and they're in a sewing box, but every pair of scissors, every pair of tweezers, all the bakeware has got this goo in it and she's super frustrated. So she's washing it off and we were having neighbor kids over and baking. And then I found more of it under the bathroom cabinet with lighters and stuff. And that's when I realized, oh shit. This is drug risk. This is this is a this is not goo. <laughs> like I couldn't figure out what this yucky stuff was, but it was drug residue. It, it was hash. So all these children have been handling with their bare hands all this hash, and you know they did wash it out, but they did it. And the youngest was seven. That was over to our house. I felt horrible. I thought, oh my gosh, are these kids, you know, what have they maybe put in their bodies? And then uh, I did find the notebook with all the information about um, what he'd been doing all this time. We contacted the kid's pediatrician. At that point, they were having um, major anxiety. My daughter was having panic attacks, um, so they were very physically afraid. So we went to the pediatrician, and she said, you know, I, I think you should flee. I think you should get out of here. Um, And once she found out that we'd actually already been living separated from him for a year in a different state, she said, well, then there's nothing holding you here legally at all. You know, you're going to have the sheriff's blessing to to leave this location. You you are no longer residents of this area, really. So you can leave. So we, we did just flee. And they told me not to, you know, tell him why or speak to him at first. So I didn't. Um, When I finally did speak to him, you know, he was pretending to not know what it was about. And since then, we have talked mostly just by text or by email because I want it all in writing. Uh, He hasn't come after the kids yet. It's been a year, Um, but we're just kind of in this weird holding pattern. When it first all blew up a year ago this month, he promised me, the kids, by email, he was going to get therapy He was going to be open and honest and fix his life. And, um, you know, he said that I had very high integrity and he really trusted me with the kids and that it was him and he needed to get better. So that was a year ago. He met with a therapist twice and decided that therapy was stupid. And all the books about, you know, psychology are also stupid. And so he's decided he'll do his own therapy. And he's thinking about himself and writing about himself, and he's calling that therapy. (laughs) So I have no income right now. Um, He has the bulk of our money, which he keeps in a business account, and he puts a certain amount in personal checking every month, and he he is still giving me access to that, and it's been a year. Um, I'm using that for the kids. Um, We live pretty frugally, Um, but at any moment, I suppose he could change that. I don't know what he will do. I'm not him. So I'm just sort of slowly um, building my own resume here locally with people. I'm on several um, different boards and just trying to figure out what I might like to do next. 
Um, and he's still telling me, I love you. I'm sorry. I miss you. But if I try to talk about any of this stuff, he says, no, 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 we're not talking about the past. You know, let's just move on. <laughs> and, you know, okay. Um, I've asked him, you know, why would I believe? And I don't, don't get me wrong. I do not believe it would change. He has not kept his word once on anything big or small. And all he could say was that felt unfair to him. And I said, can you think of a single time to me, to the kids, where you've ever kept your word? And he can't. But we should still believe this time would be different. So the kids are, you know, teens now. They don't believe it. I don't believe it. So we're just sort of in this weird holding pattern. Um, I've been told by multiple lawyers and pediatricians that as soon as someone files for divorce, then we have to be sharing the kids 50 50. And if that kid's still alive, you're sharing them. You know, it doesn't matter what's happened. It doesn't matter how dark things could get. Um, if they're alive, they'll be passed. And so I'm not filing for divorce. He has not, to my knowledge, filed yet for divorce. Um, and uh, he tells me it's because he loves me and loves the kids and wants to be together. I did find yet another notebook where he um, was writing that all of these problems are for me. I just have such, um, what do you call them, bitter control issues. I have very bitter control issues. <laughs> um, and uh, he thinks he's a really good guy and a good dad. And um, the only reason he's stayed married for many years now is finances. He does not want to split up, you know, our homes, our properties, our money. So I do have very strong mixed emotions. I'm super disgusted. I am pissed. I, you know, this was my life. And also I would say last year I did quite a lot of crying. I didn't want to cry in front of the kids because I wanted them to, they were just disgusted and pissed. A couple of times, the younger one cried. The older one, decide, because they're autistic, they decided he died. So that's where they're at. The younger one has cried and said, I don't understand. Does he? Did he ever love me? Like, even when I was a little baby? Watching your kids go through that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde experience is extremely painful. You don't want to see anyone go through that, much less your kid. Um, and, and I can't fully wrap my head around it. I have memories where I really thought he loved me. And then other memories where he's betraying me, he's lying, he's scary as hell. Um, in my mind, I guess he's two separate people is where I'm at with it. Um, and I've been trying to get rid of the bad one for all these years. And I'm realizing now, no, they both live in the same body. He's equally attached to both of them. Um, and he's not interested in letting go of either of them. Um, it would be easier if he would just be one or the other, quite frankly. If someone's just evil all the time, you know how to deal with them. Um, but right now, I did cry a lot last year. I cried about feeling like we really had something. I cried about, oh, I guess this is it. Like, I've wasted my life. Uh, I cried, you know, for the kids' kind of childhood. It was not how I dreamed. That part's the worst part. Yeah, their childhood was not what I dreamed it would be. Um, and now they're hurt and they're still young and that's not fair. That sucks the most. I, I don't think he really understands love the way I do. I've had lots of conversations with him this year about how his brain works. And it's not normal. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not normal because I'm autistic, but his is not normal. I asked him, why, did, why would you do all of this to a woman who really loved you and to your sweet kids? And he said, well, I thought you could never get away from me. And I said, so the fact that we couldn't get away from you made this okay? And he was like, yeah, I guess so. And, you know, he was like, I, I, I haven't hit you. I work hard. I do some really good things. And so I feel like that should balance out. There's moments where I'm trying to say, but you threatened the kids' lives in front of the kids. They saw that. They heard that. And he says, I don't even step on ants. And I'm like, well, that's awesome for ants. <laughs> you know, so he, he seems to be in this place psychologically where he's trying to balance out his own soul. And he finds the balance to work out. And he doesn't want to hear anything otherwise. So, um, like, how can there be humans who live among us? and convinced everyone around us that they're one way, 
but actually there's this hidden piece to them that's completely different and you know yeah he has some control over it he can hide it from most people but yet it's almost like he needs that release he needs people he can show his real self to or he may explode you know so so the the family becomes that like release valve for him um but I, it's actually really fascinating and um i'm sorry it sounds terrible but i keep asking him questions about what he what his process is and the things he says are are terrifying but also interesting yeah <laughs> so we're almost done here we have one more thing to do which is your words of wisdom. So what are your words of wisdom or advice for everyone that is listening today? Oh, that's really good. Um, trust your body and your gut feelings. Um, if something seems wildly bad, it probably is. Um, and also um, that there are people who can very carefully craft an image that maybe is not the full picture. Um and research honestly like i didn't know what the hell was going on and i did try to ask a couple of friends and they had no idea what i was talking about so i just started googling um stupid questions like are all husbands abusive um are all men abusive uh you know and found lemmy bancroft's book being able to research information and you know, then finding all these online communities and people like yourself and hearing all these other people's stories. And um, as horrible as it is, this is not that rare. And, and don't believe the person doing something bad to you. That That is not the person you should believe. You know, if they've lied to you once, you really shouldn't keep believing them. So, Jill, I really want to thank you for being here today. You did a great job telling your story your you know you went through a tremendous amount of abuse right from the beginning and it's amazing the power of other people's influence we've heard it many different times on the show of you know people that are vouching for other people and the person that you are seeing in their regular life and how everybody loves that person and how that can really suck you in in the beginning and you're getting these conflicting messages early on which you know keep you there to a certain point you know once you start to have children all bets are off and That's the other big lesson, yes. <laughs> once you have children, all bets are really off and you, uh, you're, you're in you know, protection mode and you're surviving and you did you know, uh, the best you could with what you had and you kept those kids safe and you did your job and you have nothing to be ashamed about for you know, being in these relationships, everyone who's listening. There's no shame when any of these things happen. You're in this survival survival mode and you go. And I'm just happy that you're safe, that you are far away from this person right now, that you, your kids are. And, you know, today you really did a, a service for everyone who is is listening. I mean, you ran the gamut of all different types of verbal abuses, intimidation, and you really articulated yourself well. And you really, you know, you really did a really good piece of uh, work here today. And I really want to thank Can you. Can I tell you one more thing? Oh yeah, sure. C could I give one more piece of advice? Yeah, go for it. Um, for anybody going through this, one of the biggest surprises and blessings of finally talking to people and doing this deep dive this happens to doctors, lawyers, teachers. This happens to writers. And, you know, this happens to pediatricians. This happens to psychologists. Okay. This happens to women who have worked in domestic abuse fields for 20 years. It still happens. And when it happens to you, it's still really fucking confusing. And you still don't always make the right decisions. And so for me, that has helped me with that shame piece, like you said. Because that really stops you. In the beginning, it did stop me from telling my friends. I was so humiliated. Um, 
But this happens to a lot of people that are very smart, very put together people. And when it's happening, they're still confused by it. They still get stuck. So that helped me so much. Well, Jill, I really just want to thank you once again today for being our guest and helping so many people by telling your story. And if you want to be a guest like Jill was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in in the format that we ask for. Also at our website, we have our very own support group. So if you look at the top of the page at NarcissistApocalypse.com, there's a button that says support group. When you click on that button, it takes you to our support group page. There you will see that we have our very own safe social network. And on there, we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on, for you to get validation, for you to validate other survivors as well. It's a great group of people on there, so please do join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're going through. They have every phone number, every website address and email address for shelters and agencies no matter how big or small your town is domesticshelters.org has it there and that is it for today's episode so for myself and jill we hope you have a good night